everyone and welcome back to the channel. This is the Darklight Emissary and today's video is going to cover the mysteries and horrors of the warp itself. This subject is a big one and this video is going to be on the shorter side. Mostly I'm going to cover a few of the best bits from novels that I like about warp incursions onto ships, things like that. Before we dive straight in, I just want to welcome you to this channel if you are new and continue to thank you for your support if you are not so new to this channel. I really appreciate it. Consider a like and subscribe if you would like to join us for more lore videos on this channel. We are at video 101 as of this video and many more are on the way in the future here. And just one other thing here at the beginning, I just want to mention that if you do decide to contribute any money through membership or just uh, super chats or anything like that in the comments, just know that I plan on using any money I do make from this channel, now that it's partnered on the ads and things like that, to invest back into this channel. I want to make higher production value stuff, but some of that's going to cost money that I simply don't have, unless this channel does provide some of it, which it is on track to do to a certain degree. So I just want to let you know that, that if you do decide to contribute, it will go directly towards making this channel a better channel over time. Just thought you should know. A couple of you have already decided to contribute a little bit, and that is very much appreciated. Never expected, and never do I feel like I am entitled to your money. But I just wanted to let you know that if you do contribute, you will see over time that reflected in future content as things get improved, whether it's my microphone software I'm using to make the videos, things of that nature. So let's dive straight into this topic. We could really talk forever about the warp. It is one of the biggest realms in the entire setting. It's possibly endless. We don't really know the true depths of the warp. We know that it doesn't operate on physical means at all. There is no such thing as physical distance there. There's no such thing as time there. And likewise, the creatures that call that dimension home are not like us at all in the mortal realm. And what came to mind while thinking about doing this video were a few of the incursions that I remember most from reading in the novels. And these will cover some incursions that aren't necessarily caused by, nor involve the Chaos Gods directly, nor their servants, which I find interesting as well, because the warp is populated by creatures that are not fully aligned with any of the four Chaos Gods necessarily. And because of this, we get a wider range of how they can look, because typically, if a demon manifests that is aligned with one of the four Chaos Gods, they tend to somewhat be templated to look a certain way, to speak by the very nature of the god they serve. Not so with the beasts of the warp. They come in many different varieties and sizes and terrifying shapes, and we're going to cover a couple of those now. One of the examples I can remember comes from the horse heresy novel, Furious Abyss. Now, this novel is maligned for a number of reasons, but not for this one we're going to cover. I have not read this book in a very long time, but there was a very particular time where a Gellerfield failure caused an incursion of the warp upon a loyalist ship. And when this happened, there was a hole in the hull of the ship. That's quite the uh, language there. A hole in the hull of the ship there. And coming through this break in the hull uh, was a warp entity. And it kind of oozed its way in and kind of took the form of a giant, viscously slimed worm with teeth and appendages all over it. And it started to flail itself around and grab marines and kind of swing into them and try to devour anything in its path. It was essentially this formless creature that pushed its way in like some kind of giant ocean predator trying to just get a vestige of their souls as sustenance. Regular marine fire, as far as I can remember, because I don't have the book handy right this minute, but as far as I can remember, regular fire from the space marines was not effective at all. And luckily for them, they did have a Thousand Suns Marine with them that was willing to use his sorcerous powers, and he was able to banish this creature back into the warp, and then they were able to get the Gellerfield back online and shield the ship from further incursion at that point. And that's something I do want to point out. Something I think that is often assumed is that if your Gellerfield fails, which is the shielding around a ship when it enters the warp, that you're just going to die. That, you know, the ship is a, a loss in that there is no way of getting back out of the warp at that point. Several of the examples I'm going to go over tonight are basically showing the opposite of that, where like this ship did not die in the warp simply for being, uh, you know, weakened to the warp at that point, having its shield turned off for a time. And a couple of these other examples, the shield never turns back on necessarily. The ship is a loss and still 
characters do not die just from being in the warp itself. The second example I want to give talks about a captain of a ship, and I don't remember which novel this is. I want to say it's a Tanith novel, but I do not remember. Someone can comment if they remember this as well as me. But I distinctly remember the situation, and a ship translates into the warp, and the captain is sitting on his command throne, and their shield fails in the warp. And once it fails, the captain is looking up, like at the top of his ship, like at the ceiling of his ship, but he's no longer looking at a ceiling. Instead, he's looking at a sky. And he witnesses things like trees growing and decaying before him and flower fields and just all kinds of twisting emotions that turn into actual objects right before his very eyes. And this goes on for some time, like some sort of fever dream, before a bunch of warp creatures are attracted by this gluttoning of souls and starts tearing apart him and his crew and devouring their very souls. The creatures that are attracted are likened unto almost like a swarm of piranhas or something like that where they're kind of these smaller shoals of warp creatures that try to hunt down and devour things that end up in the warp as fast as they can. Not too much detail is given on those creatures that I can remember, but I do remember that they were basically like a vicious swarm of small creatures that just worked to basically do what piranhas do best, so to speak, and devour until there was nothing left. And if it wasn't this novel, this happens often enough where the people that are being devoured often see, like, not blood, but, like, the gold light of their souls being swallowed and devoured by whatever is eating them when they get trapped in the warp. They see a very part of their very soul getting eaten and devoured, typically, before they themselves disincorporate completely into the currents of the warp itself. My next example comes from the Eisenhorn novels, and this might be in the second or third book of the Eisenhorn trilogy. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember the situation. There was a man that both Eisenhorn and another Inquisitor named Boke wanted to talk to, and they found him, but he was trapped within his head by the warp itself. I think he was some sort of psyker, like Eisenhorn and Boke were as well. So both Eisenhorn and Voke have to go into this man's mind to find him within a mindscape that is currently being overtaken by the warp itself. The man had done something to attract the attentions of the warp, and for that he was going to basically have his soul devoured. And before that was to happen, Eisenhorn and Voke needed some information from him. They find this man in a memory that he has in his own mind, and I don't remember exactly what the memory is, but... They essentially walk up to him and are able to start talking to him about the information they need from him. And they even promise to try to save him from the damnation that's coming for him from the warp itself. I don't think it says directly, but I believe it's some form of Zench or Zench itself coming for this man in this case. And you'll see why in a second. After Eisenhorn and Voke get the information from this man, they then basically tell him they can't save him, but they could obliterate his soul for the, him if you know he wants that as a small mercy the man simply replies with you know damn both of you damn both of you to the warp essentially and then the ground cracks around them and a gigantic pillar of flesh with i think it described frothy eyeballs all over it comes out of the ground wraps itself around the man and tears him to pieces voke and eisenhorn make a hasty retreat and basically do what they have to do to get out of this man's mind to not get devoured by this same warp entity. And due to Zench's proclivity for eyeballs everywhere on his servants, I assume it was some kind of Zench demon, but we don't really get much more than that descriptor of just this assumedly wet looking tentacle thing with just eyeballs all over it. Just the way it was described was just pretty visceral and awesome in my opinion and horrifying all at the same time. And it's kind of a, a being type that we don't really see much when warp entities show up. Usually they're bipedal or can talk or something, but this just seemed like a very bestial, lower level, but powerful entity. And then I believe the next one will be my last one for now. I can do a follow-up video to this if you all enjoy this one and want more of it. But the last one comes from the Ultramarines Omnibus, Dead Sky Black Sun novel. In this novel, at the very beginning, we have Ariel Ventress, captain of the Ultramarines, along with Pisanius, his sergeant. They have been banished from the Ultramarines chapter, essentially, so they have all iconography ripped off their armor. They basically are wearing new, uh, blue colored armor, but no insignia, nothing indicating what chapter they're from. And right now, they are on some sort of Imperial transport ship, 
to some kind of battlefield or someplace. Basically, they're seeking redemption for their supposed sins from the previous novel that they were in. This transport ship was big enough to have a training facility aboard, so that's what Uriel and his sergeant were doing. They were running drills through this training facility, running through buildings, like doing clearing actions, things of that sort. And there seemed to be an Imperial Guard regiment of some kind with them aboard as well that would kind of like look their way and be kind of like other space marines over there. And they were kind of wondering why there was only two of them type of thing that I can recall. And so Uriel and his sergeant are having a discussion after one of their training exercises and they can feel the ship start to translate into the warp on its travel to wherever they're heading. But Uriel and his sergeant note really quickly that the Geller field has failed because when they look at the top of the ship, the top of the training facility, there's no longer the top of the ship anymore, but a open sky filled with lightning and the colors of the warp twisting and turning with, you know, the suggestion of eyes and things like that looking down upon them suddenly. The ground below them that they're standing on has turned into flesh and it's starting to eat the Imperial Guard around them, sucking them down into the wet meat of the floor that suddenly just turn into that spontaneously once the field failed. As far as I can recall, I don't remember any demons showing up yet, although there might have been some in the distance chasing down other guard that haven't been pulled into the floor, but Bazanius and Uriel immediately start trying to pull Imperial Guard up back through the floor, offering their strength as space marines to, you know, try to get some people saved in this situation. I distinctly remember, I believe, Pisanius grabbing the arm of a woman and trying to pull her up and out of the floor, and he succeeds, but Whatever was in the floor, which was basically her midriff down, was flinched all the way to the bone and devoured. And so she was a lost cause at that point. And this same scenario is playing out all around them, essentially. If you thought things couldn't get worse, well, they were about to get worse. And that suddenly some railroad tracks show up and they hear a voice basically announcing the arrival of something called the blood tracks. And this massive demon engine just starts sh arriving on these railroad tracks right before Uriel and Pisanius. The engine stops with a hiss and the ramp comes down and this absolutely large looking space marine in a butcher's gown and smoldering eyes comes down, marching down the ramp and starts walking towards them. Uriel and Pisanius try their best to fight this entity, which didn't seem to be quite a space marine anymore, and they spectacularly fail and this entity drags them both aboard the blood tracks itself. And once it has them aboard, it hoists them both up on meat hooks aboard this demon engine and basically tells them it's not going to kill them, but that it needs that it their help, their assistance for some kind of mission, actually. It wants them to find the blood heart, and it doesn't elaborate really further other than to tell them to look for the blood heart. And then after presumably a short amount of time, it drops them off on the demon world, the home world of the Iron Warriors, Medrin Guard. Which is where the name Dead Sky Black Sun comes from, because the sky of this world is like a very dead, kind of milky gray color, and the sun in the sky is just a black sucking hole looking void in the sky itself. And if you want to know more about Ariel and Pisanias from that, then I highly recommend reading that book. It's one of my favorite classics from Graham McNeil at this point. Still a lot of moments from that book that I remember very well and fondly. And so I'll just spend a few minutes here talking a bit about warp entities in the warp itself. If you thought everything in the warp was just chaos gods and their realms, that's not quite true. Most of the warp is their territory at this point in any kind of quantifiable way, even though there's not physical, you know, borders to anything in the warp. But there is such things as the chaos wastes, which technically, you know, one of the four gods has sovereignty over any given time, but they don't really pay attention to. And then you have the deep warp itself that the gods themselves don't really delve into much and don't even have much of a presence there. This is where things like the Well of Eternity lead to that Zench has dabbled in a little bit, but not even Zench really understands what the Well is or where it truly leads to in the Deep Warp. But often when, you know, navigators are peering into the Warp to navigate their ships, they see glimpses of just gigantic whale-sized or continent-sized entities just drifting through the Warp looking for food, essentially, you know, like you would imagine a giant sea creature to be doing. Some of these entities have been known to devour ships whole, especially ones that do get unlucky enough to have their Geller field come down. And, you know, you're you're lucky if only a giant flesh tentacle comes through a rip in your hole and tries to eat you versus something way more massive, just eating your ship completely wholesale. 
but that does happen on occasion as well. And a lot of these entities are maybe corrupted by the forces of chaos, but they aren't necessarily aligned with chaos. They are possibly some of the oldest entities to live in the warp and have been beasts of some kind or another since the, before the warp was ever in turmoil uh, and in chaos as it is now. At one point in time, the warp was essentially kind of gentle, kind of calm, almost like a calm surface of a lake. Once more, physical entities were born in the real world and had connections to the warp. Their emotions started fueling and causing turbulence in this lake, essentially, and causing a perpetual increase of chaos and turmoil in this lake itself until we get the realms of chaos that we're familiar with in the 40k era. And so I don't know if I would ever call warp entities ever truly benevolent. They certainly weren't nearly as vicious and angry and hungry as they are in the current era. Nearly to a soul in there, I imagine. Things like enslavers, which are almost like a warp version of a squid or octopus sort of thing, probably were not quite the nature they were when they invaded real space during the War in Heaven back millions of years before when the Necrons were facing off against the Eldar and the Cork and the Old Ones and caused a lot of devastation in real space. But it's still certainly something you probably wouldn't want to meet if it came into real space before being twisted by the initial turmoil of the warp that you know they got influenced by by that point at least i may do a video that talks more about individual entities from the warp and do more of like a deep dive on the warp that's almost like an iceberg going from like top level chaos gods and their demon types down to like the void creatures within the warp itself creatures of the void creatures of just undetermined agency undetermined alignment things of that sort but that's where i'm gonna leave it today so as always i hope that you've liked this content if you did please consider a like and a subscribe if you haven't subscribed already i appreciate your view either way though and your time here you will find in my description a link to discord if you want to join us there and just have fun uh, building a community with us and then you will also find a link to curiosity box in my description I am not sponsored by them, but I just like their product and thought you might like it too. So a link is there for them as well. Basically imagine like a science and technology box that just kind of has some interesting gizmos and gadgets every like six months is what they basically do with it. And just as a reminder, I do live streams every Friday right now. We are currently playing through Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 at the moment, Necron campaign. We would love to see you there for just hangout and discussion time. Usually I'm doing it around 6 p.m. Arizona time. And as always, I hope you have a great day or night wherever you are, and I would look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks and have a great night. Talk to you soon.